today, I am honored to introduce Evan Baer, uh, but chances are most of the people in this room know him already, uh, because Evan is a connector of the first caliber, and he really makes an effort uh, to get to know uh, everyone in the Adam Smith Society and in influential networks around the country. Uh, he is the first member of the Adam Smith Society, just as Marilyn Fedak was there at the beginning, so was Evan Baer. He founded a group at Harvard Business School called Ideas at Work about five years ago that sought to explore the political and economic principles of individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Evan wanted to replicate the success of Ideas at Work on other business school campuses, an idea that he shared with Gene Meyer, the president of the Federalist Society. And when Marilyn and a few of us from the Manhattan Institute went down to have a meeting with Gene to discuss the idea of the Adam Smith Society, which we were developing, he said a phrase that I've now heard from many other people since then, if you want to get this off the ground, you have to talk to Evan Baer. Uh, we did, and like so many other ventures, after a successful meeting with Evan, the Adam Smith Society was officially born. In the opening of his book, Get Backed, which, by the way, is the number one best-selling book for entrepreneurs starting companies, and all of you have received a copy of it in your bag. It's a little plug. Uh, Evan mentions that when uh, Sheryl Sandberg introduced him to Mark Zuckerberg, he said, she said, Mark, meet Evan. He's the only person I've hired because he asks great questions. And if you've ever been on a call or in a meeting with Evan, you know that to be true. He asks great questions. He asks a lot of them. He knows how to bring the best out of people, and he's always getting them to think in ways they otherwise might not. He also knows how to foster relationships that matter in business and in life. Uh, Evan is going to be talking to us a little bit about a number of things, but also about his latest venture, Able, a fintech company that provides small businesses with low interest rates loans. Before Able, he founded Outbox, the postal mail disruptor shut down by the federal government, worked for Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg and PayPal's Peter Thiel, ran the Congressional Human Rights Caucus, and graduated magna cum laude from Princeton, Yale, and Harvard Business School. On top of all that, he's married and has two beautiful children. He's a constant reminder to me that I need to do more and do better. Please join me in welcoming Evan Baer. Hey, give me a hug. Well, good morning, good morning. Uh, you know, gosh, this is such an honor to be here. I literally have been looking forward to this for months since I was invited to be here this, um, this weekend. You know, one of the things I love about the Adam Smith Society is a genuine desire that you all have, that we have, to get to know the other side. You know, to take other people's arguments seriously. I mean, isn't it right that before you criticize a liberal, you really need to walk a mile in their shoes? Because then when you criticize them, you're both a mile away and he has no shoes. Okay? <laughs> Don't forget that. Don't forget that. But seriously, um, to the Adam Smith team, to Marilyn, who is our uh, benefactor and visionary, the other serious legends of capitalism that are in this room, and the chapter leaders and just the members, you are taking time and making sacrifices to be here because you care about ideas, ideas that we have in common, and I'm thankful for your service of your time and your money and your energy, so thank you. Um, I hope this morning will be a little bit fun. All right, let's get some slides up. Yeah, isn't this first slide always awkward? So let me begin with this. I want to tell you a little bit about me, and then we'll dive into what I hope is a bit of a provocative set of comments this morning, then we'll have a few minutes to engage around. Number one, I'm a real person. This is my son, Cooper. This is my daughter, Madeline. I live in a house in Austin, Texas. If you move there, I know a realtor. We can like live in real homes. If you come to Texas, please come see us. I run a fintech company in a really cool building in downtown Austin, which is the restored power plant downtown. That's just a little bit about me. I get to be in New York, used to live here, and uh, it's fun to be up here, though I wish it weren't freezing outside. So here's my talk, actually, for today. It's becoming a bad Adam Smith society for capitalism. Uh, no, we're adults here, and so I think I'll actually say the real phrase, becoming a badass for capitalism. That's what I want you guys to be. That's what I'm trying to be. And I want to share a few ideas about maybe how we could get there as you embark on your careers as we're all doing this together. All right, so the things I'm going to talk about today are really threefold. Number one, what is the promise of our network? That is the Adam Smith Society and the free markets movement generally. Number two, a reason that you're really likely to fail at it. These are going to be some tough words, not from me, from someone else. And number three, 10 strategies for crushing it. We're going to run pretty fast and keep this lively, and then we'll turn to some Q&A at the end. I've got three things initially I want to throw at you, though. 
Three quick notes, these are important. Okay, number one, I actually wanna give you money. More on that in a second. Number two, I wanna help you raise money. And number three, I really do mean this. Okay, number one, uh, I run a company called Able. We have invented a way to fund small businesses with really low cost of capital. And we're really proud of what we do. Um, let's see it, show of hands, who is currently working on a company? Even if it's not incorporated, raise your hands if you're working on a company right now. Okay, a few, a handful, cool. Well, I know we're doing some consulting sessions later, but if you're working on a company right now, whether you're pre-revenue or post-revenue, I really would love to spend time with you today and see if there's ways that I can take all the money that we've raised and give it to you. Now, we want you to pay it back. It's important. But I really do have money, and I really want to give it to you. All right. Um, number two is, um, I wrote this book. Barbara said something really silly, uh, which is nice, which is if you come pitch on Shark Tank, read the book first. You know, it's really easy for the person introducing you to plug your book when you're getting it for free. Um, so you already have received the book. We wrote this book out of working with and interviewing about 100 founders who have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. My co-author and I have this book, have each raised $100 million for ventures. And we believe that one of the greatest rights people have and opportunities is to launch and build a business. And that for many people, you have a great idea, you want to hustle, but you run into roadblocks about how do you raise capital for it and how do you get it funded. So we created this book to actually lower the barrier to entry and help you understand how do you put a pitch deck together, how do you articulate your business, and how do you get it funded. And that's our hope for the book, and that's I hope you guys would read this book, and if you're working on an idea, use that book to kick you in the butt a little bit and get out there and raise some money. So we'd love to be helpful around the content of the book. And um, the last piece of this is, uh, I really mean it. At the end of this talk, I'm gonna put up my email address, and I want everyone in this room, if you're interested, send me an email, and what I'll write you back is several added chapters that are not in the book, and also the slides I'm about to present will come right back to you in an email. And so that'll happen at the end. I'm not gonna do it now, because if you did now, you'd be looking at your phone and not listening to what I'm saying, okay? All right, so here we go. All right, what is the promise of our network, uh, the Adam Smith Society? I showed up to Harvard Business School seven years ago and was struck by a few kind of bizarre things. Number one, there was a poll by the campus newspaper, unofficially, the year before I got there, that found that over 90% of the students expressed an interest in voting for Barack Hussein Obama. Now, you can be a business school student and vote for Democrats. Um, it's not my choice, but you can certainly do that. But that 90% or more of the students would say they would vote that way, it's a higher percentage than the city of Cambridge. Uh, would actually express. And as Buckley's great line, like you'd rather be ruled by the f random set of the phone book uh, than by the faculty of Harvard or the people of Cambridge. All right, so stunning factors. Why is liberalism so dominant? Number two, really crazy story about where our ideas come from. We have these module notes at Harvard, which are sort of little primers on a topic. And one, as we were studying the Middle East, was a primer on what is Islam? Okay, reading this thing is kind of interesting. Begins, Islam is a religion of peace. Okay, so let's talk about this. Okay, so in the footnotes it says, a special thanks to the Saudi Foreign Tourism Ministry for contributing to this module note. <laughs> this conference is not about Islam, but I'm flagging that to just say we have a weird issue of where are ideas about philosophy and economics and political theory coming from at business schools. It, it, at least in some part, it's from the Saudis. This is crazy. The last thing is, I really believe that the vast majority of people at my experience at Harvard Business School are Keynesians. Now, that's not inherently a problem. The problem is that they don't know what that means. So the stunning lack of intellectual honesty and seriousness about questions of economics and political theory is stunning, given that you guys in the schools where you are are minting the next generation, not just of business leaders, but of elected officials, of investors, et cetera. So that really freaked me out at Harvard, and that was the beginning of, let's do something about this. The inspiration, and you heard a little bit about it before, there's a bunch of old, uh, some dead, some nearly dead, mostly white people, um, which is really common in the free markets movement. And uh, no, this is the Federalist Society. And uh, what's awesome about the Federalist Society is that it is literally the case today that if you are intending to be an elected official or a judge or an appointed official, that the sign that you were in the Federalist Society is, makes you persona non grata among liberals and is the entry card for a serious conversation with conservatives and libertarians. And that is really my hope that we replicate that same model, but on the business leadership side. So my hope for Adam Smith, and I don't think this is the actual mission statement, but I really want us to be the most powerful network for capitalism in the world, and I believe this will be a network that will serve you, that will help you get your business funded, that will help you recruit people, may do all kinds of things for you, and it will be a network that you serve, that when people in the network call you to ask for advice on stuff, you're more likely to answer their phone call 
then, um, then I would hope someone, random person from your school. And that's my hope for Adam Smith. So that's a bit on this network. Now, why might we fail at this mission? Everyone here is polished and thoughtful, and you dress nicely today, and you got invited to this fancy conference, and isn't that nice? And you know, just, you're just connectors. You're just awesome people, right? So like, what, what could derail us? Well, I want to share some pretty intense words from a guy named Peter Thiel. Peter's got a pretty interesting story. Peter set out to be the ultimate libertarian legal activist. Stanford undergrad, wrote a book there, founded and ran the Stanford Review, a libertarian magazine. Went on to Stanford Law School, and then he clerked for Judge Edmondson. And like all good elite conservative young people, lawyers, um, he applied to be a clerk on the Supreme Court. Peter had won everything he ever entered in his entire life. Until that day, after those interviews for his Supreme Court clerkship, he was rejected. It never happened to him before. So shortly after that, he picked up the phone and he called a friend of his named Max. And he starts talking about what he's going to do with his life. And Max said he's working on some kind of startup concept. And Peter found it interesting. And Peter joins him. And that little idea was PayPal. Subsequent to that, Peter becomes a seed investor in Facebook and Palantir, the network of PayPal alums have gone on to create tens, probably hundreds of billions of dollars of equity value. And it's an extraordinary story, but one that Peter admits happened to him through an exogenous force beyond his control. So what can we learn from this? Well, Peter wrote a book called Zero to One. It's been translated in 27 languages, sold 1.3 million copies. Blake Masters, a good friend, is a co-author with Peter of this important work. And I'm going to provide some words in here, which I want you to know. Number one, they're not from me, so don't hate me for saying this. Number two, these words really apply to me. They really applied to me about 10 years ago. They apply a little bit less today. Um, I think they may apply to you. All right, so what does Peter have to say about all this? So number one, in middle school, we're encouraged to start hoarding extracurricular activities. In high school, ambitious students compete even harder to feel omnicompetent. By the time a student gets into college, he spent a decade curating a bewilderingly diverse resume to prepare for a completely unknowable future. Sort of David Brooksian style of the organization kid. I don't know if this resonates in your ears, but I'm thinking back to like mom slapping me on the wrist. You know, violin, you will keep playing the violin. This is me, okay? Now, higher education is then the place where people who had big plans in high school get stuck in fierce rivalries with equally smart peers over conventional careers like management consulting and investment banking. I remember case prep, Princeton, got to get that job at McKinsey. This is me, OK? These are hard words. Peter writes, come what may, he's ready for nothing in particular. For nothing in particular. Even worse, people who are on this trajectory, and these are the most devastating words in this whole book, I think. All Rhodes Scholars had a great future in their past. How many roads, well, I'll just say, um, we are all in this situation right now. We are at this inflection point of an opportunity in front of us for greatness and materially impacting the world, or people who had stored up all these credentials and then not done anything with them. All right, Peter has a two by two matrix. We have definite optimists, indefinite optimists, definite pessimists, and indefinite pessimists. Let me tell you what each of these are. All right, so the indefinite pessimist says, I'm looking out into the bleak future that looks pretty bad, but he or she is not sure what to do about it. Indefinite pessimist. The definite pessimist believes that the future can be known, and since it will be bleak, he must prepare for it. Okay, then the important two are what kind of optimist are you? Get ready. The indefinite optimist says, the future will be better, but he doesn't really know how, so he makes no plans for it. Then the definite optimist says the future will be better than the present if I plan and work to make it better. So the challenge we have right now is, and earlier in my life and on bad days, I am an indefinite optimist. I have a sense that the future is going to be better, and my goal is to be around the people that are going to make it better who are actually doing something, because when you're around those people, you're likely to profit from what they're doing. That's how we live as indefinite optimists. We don't know what we're doing who are around the people that are and that do. The definite optimist, Peter looks to examples in, of definite optimism in American history, and he points to the Empire State Building, which was built from the foundation up in two years. The Golden Gate Bridge was built in three years. The Manhattan Project, which conceived and developed and built the first nuclear weapon, was four years in duration. 
If you know anything about the Big Dig in Boston or the World Trade Center here, you have some sense that something is really broken. And Peter argues that this is a cultural indictment of we are all indefinite optimists. So applied to people like us, he argues indefinite optimists are bankers who rearrange capital structures of already existing companies, lawyers who resolve disputes over old things, and private equity investors who squeeze extra efficiencies from old businesses. Peter argues these are indefinite optimists. Now this is probably better than the pessimist version, but there's also a call for the definite optimist. So he writes, it's no surprise that these fields all attract disproportionate numbers of high achieving Ivy League optionality chasers. Because what could be a more appropriate reward for two decades of resume building than a seemingly elite process oriented career that promises to keep the options open? You guys are in the job right now of finding options for your career. You need to open doors. My hope is that you'll figure out how to start closing them and work with me to move into being a position of being a definite optimist. Peter's words are tough. So this is my fear, that we are indefinite optimists. And my solution is that I hope we can build a definite plan to change the future. All right, 10 strategies to help you shift and move towards this idea of being a definite optimist. All right, number one. Like I mentioned before, um, you're gonna get all these slides. So please don't write this down, because then you won't listen to what I'm saying. Here we go. Number one, learn how culture is made. There's a common misconception that culture is the amalgam of lots of individual preferences for positions on issues or beliefs. So a lot of us think, well, the reason the country's gone liberal is that a lot of people and individuals believe this, and so that's what kind of trickles up. It's wrong. It's not true. Randall Collins, a philosophy and professor of sociology at, at Harvard, has a wonderful book called The Sociology of Philosophies, which is sort of the magnum opus, which explains how culture is created. And essentially, the core thesis there is that culture is created by elites, in particular, installed in overlapping networks of elites. And it's a case study of how 15 ideas that began as fringe concepts uh, became normalized. And it was not through grassroots movements generally. It was through overlapping networks of elites. So because we're in the battle for ideas and the fruition, the promotion of capitalism, we need to understand how culture is created. So you should study this. And in this email you'll get from me, you'll get a summary of Colin's book. We need to understand the rules of the game if we're going to win it. Number two, you need to curate your intellectual diet. Just like we think about vitamins and supplements and proteins for our physical body, I would argue that my experience at least was five years out of undergrad, five years out of graduate school, I really feel like I'm coasting on the fumes of the few great books I read in college. So it's important for us is to continue to stay renewed in our commitment to these principles by the regular engagement of these ideas and the Adam Smith Society in your business schools and also in your cities when you graduate are places to do this. Not only must you nourish what you already know, but you must supplement it by things that you do not know. I believe that William F. Buckley was one of the most winsome and effective communicators of conservative libertarian beliefs because he had a wonderful knowledge of food and literature and opera and he could cavort with any liberal on any issue that they wanted to and then sneakily, winsomely bring in truth. Next, curate your social diet. Interesting idea. You are the sum or the average of the five people you spend time with. Think about that for a second. Who do you spend time with? What ways do they challenge you or create opportunities for you? Curating your social diet, to me, Peter has a great line. He says, the worst people, if you want to start a company, the worst people to go spend time with are MBAs. Right? Because they actually don't have any ideas. Fair. Uh, so Peter's advice on this is go find the chemistry postdoc who's head down in the corner of a lab that has no idea how to build a slide deck or commercialize a product. That's the person that people like us want to spend time with. So generally, people like us and everyone really suffers from network homophily, which means we spend time with people our same race, age, religion, neighborhood ideas. So challenge yourself to think about diversifying that social diet. Building a personal CRM. So CRM is a tool. Companies often use Salesforce. It's a way of keeping information organized about people. I believe that the best way we can be effective for advancing ideas, helping companies get funded, helping people get elected, the whole range of strategies we have is by organizing people. So I would make a challenge to you. When you leave your business school program, you should know every person in your Adam Smith Society chapter. You should know 10 or 15 people from the Federalist Society chapter at the law school if your university has one. 
And when you get out in the real world, I would challenge you to build a tool. I use one called Contactually. I'll put a write-up in the thing that's coming out to you guys by email that helps me organize those people. So that means that when I hear about an interesting opportunity where there's some dinner that people need to get invited to or someone's trying to write a book or someone's trying to run for office, you're not trying to think back like, oh, I did meet that person that one time. If you have a way of finding them, that means you can be much more effective for all the causes and issues that come across you. Build a personal CRM. Number five, learn to raise money. The reality for nonprofits and political campaigns and most effective ways that we communicate and advance ideas, uh, they involve money. Raising money is really awkward. If you've never carried a quota before, if you've never sold Cutco knives door to door, um, I would really encourage you to find a way to practice learning to raise money. It will help all the organizations of which you are part. Identify and join the elite organizations in your city. First, I'd start with saying, all right, what free market-oriented organizations? Is there Adam Smith's chapter? Is there a state policy network-related think tank in your city? Join the junior person board. Offer to raise money. When you get out in the real world, don't merely stay hidden away in your bank or your consulting firm. Get out and get involved in these organizations. Number seven, build a personal brand. Hi, I'm Evan Baer. One of my real passions is creating opportunity. So I run a company that's about helping entrepreneurs get funded that couldn't otherwise. I wrote a book that helps people jump off the ledge and actually start a business. And I spent a lot of time building people and organizations that share my ideas. That's, that's what I'm about. So build your own brand. What are you about? Once you have that brand, people need to understand it. You gotta communicate it and spread it. You could write a book or have a TV show. It's fine, it takes a long time to get there. But you can do good things. Like you can start on Facebook, talking about what you believe. It's easy to feel cajoled into that the left is smarter, um, but they're not. We, our ideas are right, and I would challenge you to be better communicators of your ideas. Last two, learn to communicate ideas and defend them. I'll come back to that in a second. And the last is build a business that advances freedom. And let me run through these last two very briefly. This was a Facebook post about two weeks ago I posted. And I was just lamenting the fact that food stamp participation in the United States has doubled in the last eight years. I think this is a travesty for a lot of reasons. So a nice liberal friend of mine who works at McKinsey provides this little note, yada, yada. And he says, this is lazy at worst and disingenuous at best. Right? Aren't liberals so vitriolic? My friends at least are. All right, so this superstar, she's got hundreds of thousands of followers. Evelyn, another friend of ours from Princeton, says, ah, yes. So then she has this made up quote about one of the guys I was quoting in my post. So she's kind of weighing in with an ad hominem attack on the person I was quoting, unrelated to the food stamp issue. Then another liberal friend of mine says, well, thanks for clearing that up, Matt Evans' comment, yada, yada, yada. It deserved as much. I hope you read your comment and edits his. He's saying this as if I'm not even there. Isn't this how liberals behave? I think it is. All right, another guy, this guy's great. He inherited a fortune, lives in New Haven, went to Princeton. He's an art curator. They just want to put food on the table. What makes you so heartless? All right, so all this is happening on Facebook. Now, a lot of this seems kind of trivial, but like there's different ways you can respond in this kind of debate. You're like, I'm just not going to deal with those people. Or you can take time and you can win these arguments. All right, so I listened to their arguments, <laughs> I wrote a long response, and I put up more data. They challenged my data that I put up the first time, and I admit that first chart, it was not very good. It was not long enough to make the best case. I put up a new piece of data, made the case. He responds, maybe a little more engaged. Okay, people are hungry. Do we want to pay for that or not? If starvation's not your plan, neat. Let's hear the rest of it. I really want to know. I think he was actually genuine here. All right, now, my favorite trick in the book is what I call out-liberaling the liberals. When you're debating a liberal, they hate it. Like, their head explodes when you quote Brookings. Because they're just like, no. I love Brookings, and that just showed I'm wrong. And Anyway, this is a silly example. You might be like, oh, this is just a Facebook thing. But I know if you've already not been in these debates, you will have these happen all the time. You'll be in case debates in class. You'll be talking to friends at the bar. You will be you know, around the water cooler at the workplace. We have a responsibility to understand just the basics of the arguments in defense of limited government and free enterprise. And let me end on this, a very brief retelling um, it was mentioned earlier that I started a company called Outbox, and the point of Outbox was to create an alternative to the United States Postal Service. And as we were scaling that company, we got a call from the United States Postmaster General, and we thought that it was like the ultimate business development deal of our life. And we go in for this meeting, and we explain the company that we had built and why we had secured this small-scale partnership already. And when we present that to him, we get some feedback from around the table, the board of the Postal Service. One piece of feedback was, well, the problem is no one is gonna want the service you've built because digital is a fad, it will only work in Europe. Okay, that was the first argument. The second was the Postmaster General looks at us and he says, you know, the problem is no one is gonna 
want your service because you don't understand the customers that you guys are serving are not our customers. My customers are about 400 volume mailers. My product to those customers is the guaranteed delivery of junk mail onto the kitchen tables of Americans. And that was sort of the beginning of this epic battle and uh, we lost. And I bring that up to flag a change in thinking that I'm really excited to get to have a conversation with Steve here in a few minutes who he really is the Einstein of this and I've just learned to write in this arena. Um, but here's what I used to believe. I used to believe that the way we change the world is you go into law or politics because that's where the battle of ideas matter. And that business is probably good for capital markets and allocation of resources, um, but it's sort of a commodity. If I don't go into it, there'll just be some other cog in the wheel churning, making capital markets work. And Peter Thiel really challenged my convictions on that topic. Peter began with public policy problems and then built multi-billion dollar companies to deliver results and change society around those things that he cared about. He cared about the increasing power of the Fed, so he made a valiant effort and built a billion dollar business to create what would eventually maybe become a global currency in PayPal. He was very concerned about the state of domestic terrorism and how bad the intelligence communities were at buying resources, so he built Palantir. Uh, he and Elon Musk wanted to reach Mars. So here's my challenge to you guys. Um, as you go out, hopefully as definite optimists, my hope is that you don't think of business as your day job and capitalism as a hobby. Whether you are in consulting or banking or private equity or you're actually building businesses, the very work that you do and the goods and services that you ship can have the potential to materially create experiences for liberty for your customers and your shareholders and your stakeholders. And by doing that in the context of building a private company with talent and private capital, you have the chance of scaling that influence dramatically faster than you could going to a think tank, and those are important, or being a lawyer, and those are important. But it's an amazing opportunity we have to be advocates for capitalism through the scalable means of business as definite optimists. All right, it's time for questions. What do we have? Uh, here's how we're gonna do this. We've got these two mics on the end, on the sides over here, and uh, if there are questions, then uh, stand up and come to those, come to those podium and, uh, and ask a question. Go ahead and do it. I'm gonna offer one or two final slides because these, the, these are the bonus slides. I really like automatic rifles. <laughs> um, I had a really wild experience. No, I really, it would be great. Sean Clifford, go ask a question. Uh -huh. Really, um, <laughs> please do get up and ask a question because we'll chat for a few minutes. So um, I do briefly want to share this because I, I do at some times think that the battle that we are in is, uh, it's not literally a military battle, though it could be, but it's really serious. This is a silly slide. I had the opportunity to go witness me a part of Bud's training for the final several days of Hell Week for the Navy SEAL program. And um, one of the things we got to do was play with weapons, which was really cool. But um, this is uh, a picture I took, which to me is really emblematic of the fight that um, these men are in and the fight that we're in. Um, this is the bell. So the men about 50 yards past this are in day four of Hell Week. They are probably past their blackout point. They will most likely not remember um, any of the final 36 hours of their training. They're, um, once they're done with Hell Week, it will probably take six months for their body to return to full health. And um, they are covered in um, sand ingrained rashes and infections and it's the most grueling physical training in the world. And this is a bell. And this bell is the bell that when you decide to drop out of Hell Week and uh, leave the SEAL training program, you come over and you ring this bell. And this is a more dramatic presentation of it and in no way to say that any of what we do is as important or hard as what the SEALs do. Um, but to me, this is this question for us. Um, as we think about being in the battle for ideas, the question I think about for us is, are we going to ring the bell? Like in those moments of awkward conversations with the water cooler, in those moments of who are you gonna vote for, in those moments of you're called on to run for office, are we really willing to sign up to be in the battle for ideas? 
So I hope this image stays with you, it stays with me, and makes me emotional even thinking about it. Um, but my hope really for us is that, that we don't ring the bell. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Kyle. Uh, just one quick question. If you are in this circular kind of path of, that brings you to consulting or banking, how do you start to think about going down the other paths? Like you, it's easy to hear a speech like this and, and agree with it, but, but where do you go next in terms of your thought process? Yeah, I have a, um, I work with a productivity coach, this sort of weird guy who has all sorts of strange pieces of advice, and this is his, which I really like. It's kind of a silly line, but he says, when you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. So I literally created a no plan in my life, and I'm like on a systematic rampage to say no to things. And it's amazing the white space that's created when you say no to things. So I don't know, that could be a first path of just say like, what are these doors you're trying to keep open right now? that you really don't think are valuable, that you're willing to close, I think that will help you focus on those other things. The other thing that jumps out to me is when I work with people who are starting companies, a real challenge that us MBA-like people have, and this is very much a criticism of me, is um, what a lot of companies are seeking is product market fit. What a lot of the people like us do not have when we start a company is we don't have founder company fit. Meaning the company we're starting, or a lot of MBA kind of companies and why we get maybe a bad rap, is it's like we don't really have any business or any story or any passion in starting that company. So one kind of inventory, so a friend of mine who is a veteran and is at Yale SOM, or was last year, I think, took the year off to build a company, um, he grew up, I believe his mom was from Lebanon, and he grew up, or his grandmother, he was Lebanese, and he grew up, and his grandmother was always making this amazing food in his home. And the company he went on to start was just this amazing idea that there are especially, um, you know, um, immigrants who are wonderful chefs in an ethnic cuisine that are making wonderful food in neighborhoods all over the United States that other people would love to enjoy. So he's trying to solve that problem. How do we create that food and bring it to other people? Now, he doesn't know anything about food safety, doesn't know anything about transportation or logistics, but when he, get up, when he gets up and tells that story of why he started that company, because of his grandmother's cooking was something that he wanted other people to get to experience, like, that's a why. You know, that's a reason that he's gonna do that. So, two thoughts, just say no to stuff and do an inventory of yourself. Like, what are the things that get you really fired up that's gonna be the passion that leads you to do something irrational, like start a company or start a fund, et cetera? Yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Sharon Dawson from Tuck. Hey. Um, thanks for coming today. Uh, so, please correct me if I'm misunderstanding your beliefs, but I get the impression that you believe if I believe, or anyone believes in a free market capitalism, they should also be a Republican. Mm. Um, mm. How does a belief in capitalism, how should that inform mm. one's beliefs in like gay marriage or abortion? Yeah, um, so no, I, I, um, <laughs> it's warm in here right now. Um, so um, I'm a party guy. I think I have a lot of loyalty to the Republican party, though it is awful and we have awful people in it, um, but it is less awful than the Democratic Party, in my opinion. Um, if you're a capitalist, you don't have to believe that. Um, I would point to the work of Pete Peterson, for example. It is really important that we get liberals to think about economics correctly. I would much rather Hillary Clinton understand capitalism than her not understand capitalism. So I hope we have Democrats in this room, and I hope you guys go become friends with Democrats, because they're gonna run companies. I would guess of like the thousand most influential people in the United States, 90% uh, are Democrats, right? So if we stay to Republicans, we're bound to like homeschoolers in rural Virginia, <laughs> right? So we have a lot of work to do to like strategically reach out to, to other populations. Um, and I think uh, what is really important is staying you know, curious and civil with people that we you know, disagree with. And a lot of, I sort of joke, I probably unfairly, those, all those people who are posting those things on my Facebook feed, they're friends of mine. I, have lunch and coffee with them, and I like to poke fun of them, and I really enjoy having those friendships. So the um, uh, last thing I'll say is, in the state of Texas, the worst opponents of limited government and especially innovation from small businesses are corrupt Republicans. They have been the leaders of fighting against Tesla's um, ability to sell vehicles. They have been the leaders in fighting against the deregulation of um, the licensing process for, for example, like hairstylists. Um, so Republicans are massively corrupt. Crony capitalism is a scourge on our country. So um, I am a party guy, but for me personally, I think it's in really bad shape. So I think that's a good question. I think we just have a few, let's do this. Let's take a power round. Let's actually do all four of your questions really briefly, and we'll see what we can answer in the time left. Go ahead. 
Hi, my name is Tomer Goldstein. I'm from, <coughs> I'm from Brandeis. Um, my quick question is, so I started the company with two other friends that deals with renewable energy. But we're basically producing pure, pure methane in a very efficient way. Yep. And uh, we're now doing some rounds uh, of funding. And basically, you know, the renewable energy and the energy uh, market is huge. And now we're being asked, we don't have any revenues yet, and we are being asked how much do we actually need. So that's a trade-off between not scaring like the investors. How much money you're trying to raise is the yeah, question you like ask. Okay, cool. We're trying to realize, uh, you know, it's a trade-off. You're not try you're trying not to scare the investors by asking too much. Yep. And on the other hand, you're trying to raise enough to so have enough to, you know, boost your idea and basically build the company. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Cameron from Wharton, thanks for the presentation. Wanted to cry and laugh, which was good. Um, just wanted to know of your hundreds of conversations with entrepreneurs, uh, maybe what surprised you most, and maybe what you, would, what you took away from that into your personal life, and maybe what you might want to be inculcated in Adam Smith. Yeah, sorry, so from my conversations with entrepreneurs, is that what you said? Yeah, through the Able Lending oh, yeah, uh, yeah, network yeah. that you've been cool. working on. Um, yeah, good. Hi, Ivan. How are you? This is Carlos Balvin from Tepper Business School at Carnegie Mellon. Hey. I have a curious question about, uh, because you are in the, in the business of funding uh, entrepreneurs, and I recently did a, a research on Bitcoin and blockchain, so I would like to know your thoughts on that and how optimistic you are about that technology. Blockchain. Great. Cool. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Glad we have four minutes. Yeah. Dustin Stewart, University of Texas, uh, Iraq vet, one day hopefully to start a uh, company, tourism service. company in Iraq. Um, I love me some libertarianism and bashing the government, but on the other hand, I always like feel kind of guilty. Like, what role? You know, we have DARPA, the internet. There's a you know the Golden Gate Bridge you mentioned. What is the role for government in the new era we're in, um, supporting capitalism? Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, hey, thanks. All right. Uh, let's just run through. These are great. Thank you for these questions. Okay. How much to raise? So. We'll just do these sequentially. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. How much to raise? So two pieces of advice in raising money in venture capital-backed companies. You want to raise as much money as soon as possible, and you want to raise as little money as late as possible. So I'll let you figure that out. No, that's the tension in raising for venture-backed businesses. Um, currently, we are going into what people smarter than I think is a horribly, horribly cold, long winter for equity markets and credit markets already are blown out. Um, Mike Maples has had three term sheets pulled. No one pulls term sheets on Mike Maples. He was the first investor on Twitter. He's on our board. Um, uh, massive Series A crunch. Probably 95% of companies that raised equity 12 months ago won't be able to raise right now. So the takeaway from all of this is slash and burn, slash and burn. If you're not a profitable company right now, dramatically lower your expenses. Like burn the ship. Cut, cut, cut. The most important thing to remember in running a kind of this kind of business is cash is king. If you run out of money, the wheels fall off and the business is gone. It's really hard and for the first time in my entrepreneurial life, the global macro economy has the biggest implications for what you do for capital markets for your startup right now. So stop with your, get, leave this conference right now and just go raise as bloody much money as you can. That's my thought. And if the valuation's really low, come to me, I'd love to invest. Okay, um, <laughs> <clears throat> what do we learn from entrepreneurs? So what's fun about um, both Able, so the conversations with entrepreneurs are in two groups from Able and uh, the work, the interviews of Get Backed. Get Backed were um, venture-backed founders raising millions of dollars for high-growth potential companies. Able borrowers are a really amazing set of people that are very different. Um, one of our first borrowers, she grew up on a farm. She owns a hair salon. Um, she had a low credit score because she had a DUI and did stupid things. Uh, she's a really hard worker. She um, sweeps the floor of her salon, you know, every night at like nine o'clock. She's exhausted. She's a single mom. So the work of Abel and working with what we call the Fortune 5 million sort of Main Street businesses is uh, really a window into the heroism of, of business owners, of business founders. Um, there's a big movement among venture-backed companies. Like a lot of us are sort of weenies. Like it's just, of course it's just fun. We go out to Santo Road and raise some money, and it's gonna be awesome. And um, but man, the people that are starting businesses, you know, they ask their uncle for fifteen thousand dollars to build a sign for a deli, 
that they make. I mean, there's amazing heroism in that. And the research we did into the public policy issues around those people, it's actually really disconcerting. The right gave up on those people a long time ago because the Fortune 500 in the Chamber of Commerce writes our checks and they fund our lobbyists. And they become crony capitalists, generally. Um, the left writes those people off because they drive a BMW. Now it's like a 10-year-old BMW and the person pulls out like $75,000 a year from their business. But they're working 80 or 90 hours a week to create three or four or five jobs. Um, so I think what really struck me from that set of conversations, and those are our customers every day, is the heroism of kind of ordinary, and I say that in quotes because it's, it, it's actually extraordinary, but to outsiders it seems like some dinky little small business that's not going to become a billion dollar company. Those people are really important. This year, in the past 40 years, there's only been four years when the small business stock of the United States has decreased. They've been the previous four years. This year, we will lose about 95,000 small businesses in the United States. And that is a massive problem facing America. Only thing I'll mention on blockchain is we're in an interesting state around um, regulatory competition. So if um, we already have this competing at the level of municipalities and states, so the state of Texas has helped facilitate the movement of several drone companies from California to the state of Texas to basically have the attorneys general compete to say, I will provide regulatory forbearance and we will compete as states as the Federalists wanted us to, to create better regulatory schema to help your company actually have a shot at succeeding. That's awesome. The crazy one for me with, relates, with relationship to blockchain is Andreessen Horowitz has facilitated, it's, it's north of 10, um, expatriations, movements to domiciling in other countries. And so there's a really serious argument here that it is not just a question of, of, of outsourcing jobs and job, jobs moving overseas. It's a question of our regulatory schema and our tax framework becoming so oppressive that the most innovative companies in the world cannot exist in the United States. Um, the last thing I'll say on this role of government question, then we're going to get Steve up here, is, um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> I was corrected on this in a, in, a, in a healthy way from the commanding officer at BUDS, who, um, you know, he said, uh, he, he said, we serve at uh, the pleasure of the president. And, um, you know, that's true whether it's uh, someone you totally disagree with or, or you love. And there's something really noble in that, that like, um, I believe this is the greatest country in the history of the world. Um, we still are, but we have a chance that we'd lose that. And uh, a lot of this spirit of government bashing is done in the great disservice, certainly to our um, people in the military, but more generally to civil servants. I know great conservative lawyers who are slaving away at treasury, and just awful jobs, but they feel like it's really important that they are there. And I'm really glad they're there. I wish that Treasury did not employ 145,000 people. Uh, it's a little too big, I think. But um, I, I, really, I really appreciate their service. Um, and so I, I appreciate that question. I don't know if you meant it this way, but I, I receive it appropriately as a good criticism, which is um, when we think about our apparatus of change and how we bring about a society that is more just and more free, um, government is not just something that must be destroyed or limited exogenously. Uh, we must be in the beast, right? We must run for office or take presidential appointments or be on the school board because they're really critical to our agent of change and how we bring about this alternative reality that all of us believe will be a place of much greater human flourishing. So um, the JV team is done. It's time to get the varsity up. And um, I want to have uh, Steve come on up and we're going to hop over here and, uh, and have a chat for a few minutes. But thank you guys for your time. But applaud for Steve, welcoming Steve up to the stage.